Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with me, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. And we're going to follow on from what we did in the last podcast and look at the paranoid client. Correct. Often called, well, in the personality adaptations book by Van Joins, called the brilliant skeptic i'm very well aware of this one bob (laughs) good (laughs) guess why okay so with all these uh well i'm guessing i'll I'll, you want me to guess why that that's because you have some affinity with the uh paranoid traits or personality yes okay oh you'll like this then I do. I love it. The more information I can get about this, okay. the better. Well, you know this yourself, so you'll be a very good person to speak on this podcast. But with all these different styles of uh, personalities that we're dealing with, I'd like just to talk about a way of thinking about this in general, and that's around a continuum of health. In other words, uh, on the on one side, you've got what some people might call... M- mild symptoms and uh, uh, something might called um, uh, in the world of the neurotic well or you might want just to call it um, traits if you wanted to and then you go up to more uh, intense traits working all the way up to the other end of the continuum which is personality disorders where the world is more black and white and fixed and there's less flexibility or spontaneity If you go to the other side, where you've got the neurotic well or the worried well, which is often called uh, on that side of it, there's more flexibility, even though there may be traits of the style. Yeah. So we're going to talk about paranoia. So on the worried well or the neurotic side, we're talking about traits. And on the other side, we're talking about much more fixed personality disorders, where there's far less flexibility there's lacking a spontaneity and it's very black and white. Yeah. And and then in the middle of that, you've got more intense traits, if you like. Uh, So it's like a continuum uh, from left to right, from mild to the other end, and more of a personality disorder or even psychosis. So whatever style we're talking about, think about and continue of health, because when you said you identified with the paranoid personality, if you like, I think you're talking about traits, yes. or what I would call in the in, in the area on the left-hand side of the continuum, which is more like the worried well or the neurotic well. There's different names for it, but it's more uh, in the arena of traits rather than the other end, which is very black and white, fixed personality, lack spontaneity. I think you're talking about uh, that you've got quite a reasonable adult, but you have certain traits that you identify perhaps with this particular style of character. Yeah, yeah. That's right. hundred percent, yes. I'm not diagnosed as anything. <laughs> luckily, luckily for me, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's some people who will disagree with that. But no, it's, it's, a, it's the traits and what you're talking about. I often talk with clients about it being like a sliding scale. You know, people talk about, narcissism an awful lot lately i don't know whether the pandemic's bringing a lot of narcissism. Well, you've got people like trump around haven't you that's it yeah yeah putin around where they're real narcissists narcissists i think on the right hand side of the scale yeah mm. was i kind of associate that with the traits around the antisocial behavior types you know that I often say that those are the people that I would see in private practice. I don't think a nurse, you know, somebody that's diagnosed with a disorder would come to see me in private practice. Well, certainly not, certainly not with the narcissistic side. I know this is a, isn't a podcast on narcissism, but on the narcissistic style, uh, if it was really personality disorder, they wouldn't even think of coming to see you. Yeah, that's that's generally what I say to people. I, you know, I wouldn't see them. Yeah. No, and you're quite right with most of the personality disorders. It's, they're so fixed. They're often been maybe in sections. They've been in the psychiatric system. 
and they're not likely really to reach out for therapies unless they're sometimes sent yeah. either, by, either by the police where part of a court order is that they get therapy or maybe by a spouse or maybe um, when people, maybe even friends of theirs said we'd better go and get therapy. But, so they might go, but people with personality disorders don't usually reach out for therapy. No, but the traits, you know, I, I like the traits. I'm quite attached to my personality traits. I've got yeah, to know them very well. That's right. So it's very important that when we're talking about these styles, we're really talking more about traits or adaptations rather than a, a real disorder. Um, because once we go into the disordered level, one, they don't usually come to therapy and be there. If they do, they're very fixed. They often have bizarre delusions, might even have fluid psychosis in front of you. Yeah. So when I'm talking about these styles or adaptations, they're, they're more in the worried well section or what we could call traits, if you like, for the case yeah. of the podcast. So if we're going to think of paranoid people or people who come from that paranoid style, one thing I always think about, they are very much come from the place they have to control the world. In other words, control is a really important part of their personality. So when they come to see a therapist, they will really uh, attempt to control the therapist. Mm -hmm. Now, that's from a surviving place because they see the world as out to get them. They see the world as threatening to them. So they need to control the world before they get swallowed up by the world. So when it comes to your therapist, control is a really important process and they will attempt to control consciously, if even not, sorry, unconsciously, even not uh, consciously, they will attempt to control the therapist. Uh, so that's a really important one to look out for. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, what you were saying, I think it's a really valid point that it's all about protection and safety and security. Oh. That's, that's where the control comes from. That's right. And in, in, in the, in, um, I'm going to talk about a book here. I'll say I'm not particularly into labels, but the book I'm going to talk about is an important book because if you're a psychotherapist, you might turn to this book because it, it talks about um, traits, but it also talks about clusters and it also talks about personality disorders. And that's the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which actually is a manual for psychiatrists and American psychiatrists. In the Britain you've got, in Britain or the UK, you've got what's called ICD-9, which is very similar, but you would, um, or you might turn to this book to just have a um, uh, some thinking about what clusters or what behaviours or what thinkings might actually make a people who've got uh, traits or even personality disorders. And one of them I was looking at, I've just got a few here, I'm just going to read one of them out to you around, this is what I'm talking about, and it says, uh, suspects without sufficient bias uh, that other people are exploiting harming or deceiving him or her yeah so they really are it's important for them to control the therapy room and also with that they will not trust the therapist and they will not trust people easily so on the traits level they're not going to trust people very easily um, in transaction analysis language, they'll have a don't think message, sorry, don't trust message. And, and when we talk about tests and other podcasts, this is where, this is, this is really quite true for this style of character. They will test the therapist, mainly because they don't trust them. And they come from a place that they could be attacked or harmed quite easily by the other. Yeah. I see it. Yeah, I know you spoke in previous podcasts that when you were talking about the meerkat, I kind of see that as kind of paranoid, where they're constantly looking, the you know, they're on high alert a lot of the time to see if if they're being caught out by something. Yeah. See the schizoid cat or the withdrawn cat are we talking about when I gave that meerkat analogy. Yeah. I understand where you're going with that as a bit of difference because what you're talking about is hypervigilance. Yeah. Now, 
with the schizoid is that it's hypervigilance about exposure. So in other words, they have a real fear of exposure and they may pop and pop down very quickly uh, because they don't want to stay exposed to the world. With a paranoid person, uh, they're hypervigilant, just like you said, because they're afraid of, of attack or afraid of being harmed yeah. or, or, or afraid of the world in that, that, that way. So they're, they're very hypervigilant. And on the straight side, you'll see that exactly the way you just started to talk about. They'll start to look around, they'll be agitated. Um, they'll, they'll probably ask questions around, you know, straightforward questions about, you know, uh, you know, why is that cushion there? Why is that seat there? How come you're sitting there? Da, 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 da. So many different types of questions. Now, I remember, I think of a paranoid person that I, I was working with uh, recently before I stopped working clinically. And uh, he rang the buzzer, so I went to the front door and he was a, he was a young lad and he had a hoodie over him. And he said, uh, I've come for the appointment with Bob Cook. And then he said, and by the way, um, don't look don't look over there because those two people by the bus stop have been following me all the way. No, don't look over there. No, no, no. And he just strode straight past me. Because, you know, that's quite an acute sense of power. Now, there weren't people following, by the way, but he had that sense of hypervigilance because he was afraid that the world was out to get him, was to going to attack him and that it was unpredictable and he needed to control the world. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's that um, you know needing to to know everything. What you were saying early on about asking lots of questions and why is that cushion there? Why do you sit there? Why do I sit here? Why all, all those sort of things? That's that kind of is what I see a lot of. Mm -hmm. you, the <laughs> first few sessions is just literally answering lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, and I think they do set tests for the therapist to pass hopefully or not and and it's that's all around trust um now usually what well, of course is when you set a test there's nearly always a failure part to it so therapists can't really pass the tests yeah uh, they can at least perhaps account for them now people are paranoid really really have a don't trust process they also um don't trust anyone in terms of being loyal to them uh, you know, they don't expect people to really be there for them or have their back. Yeah. They, they expect people to let them down. So therefore, they're very suspicious people. So they're going to be suspicious of the therapist. So that's interesting when you, for therapists who set contracts and have boundaries and have structure, yeah. the things we're talking about, because I don't know if you do this, but some therapists may have contracts where they expect the client to sign that certain things even a treatment contract level well a paranoid client would think probably it's a trick and why is a person asking me to sign anything yeah now according to their level of disturbance will be how they handle that somebody with a personality disorder wouldn't even sign it i don't think people at the level of perhaps the worried well or the trait level will ask lots of questions probably before they sign anything Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because what does it mean if I sign it? Am I contracted to being in therapy for the next five years or what am I signing? What does that mean for me? Yeah. Be very specific. And also they don't expect the therapist to be on their side. Mm. They expect the therapist to let them down. They expect the therapist to disappoint them. Yeah. They expect the therapist to actually uh, trick them in some way. Because that's the way, that's, that's really been how their world was. And they've got coping mechanisms uh, linked around survival. Um, because, there's, you know, it's like there's no one else but themselves in the world. Yeah. They can't rely on anybody else. Mm. Yeah. No, friendships and people will let them down. Yeah. I.e. the therapist will. Now, the bit is, how does the therapist get around that? So you, you, you said a moment ago you work with paranoid clients. How do you, um, you know, when we're thinking about this, the, the, the paranoid client is going to, 
yeah, it, it's going to have a don't trust message. It's going to set traps for you. It's going to be suspicious of you. It's going to expect you to let them down. What do you, how do you see the work with the client, that type of client very, you know, very early on? What do you see as the major emphasis? For me, probably consistency. Mm. You know, there's a few things. I think it's it's quite important that I remember a lot of the information that they've given me. Right, yeah. So I can clarify names of people and places and things like that so that I'm being consistent, as in I'm listening to what you're saying, I'm taking it in and I'm remembering those things about you. But consistency appointment times turning up on time doing what I say I'm going to do if I say one week we're going to work on this and then the next week I don't do it that's that's going to just fuel the fire for I don't do what I say I'm going to do yeah and you would expect the paranoid client to ask quite a lot of questions yeah. about that process yeah. lots of structure I've got my whiteboard here do you know what I mean I, I might draw diagrams and talk through the the theory of things i'm not just pulling it out of you know a rabbit out of a hat sort of thing there's there's a point to it there's structure to it mm -hmm. yeah so you're providing probably a structured boundaried consistent reliable framework which the paranoid client probably has never had or it's been an environment which has let him down yeah and i'm prepared to let them down to a certain extent, because <laughs> I, I get a sense sometimes that they will just up the ante to try and prove that the paranoia is there for a reason. Mm. Yeah, so you'll be prepared to sort of go along with that. Yeah, and be prepared to make mistakes mm. and, you know, then bring that back into the therapy room. Yeah, another sort of, uh, you know, talk about characteristics and features of the paranoid is suspicious. And they're very suspicious and very jealous, usually, usually without any justification. Now, that's really important when you think about in terms of how many clients clinicians have. Mm. So, you know, say the average professional therapist has 20 clients, just say on average. Yeah. The paranoid client will be very, will probably, if they know that, would be very jealous, very suspicious, wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want you to have a, a relation with therapists to shares you with them with other clients, and very suspicious about uh, people without any particular justification at all. Yeah, that's a shame. <laughs> no, I was just thinking. You're in the, we have a waiting room with our institute and, you know, clients sitting there and a paranoid client particularly will be very suspicious of, um, they often wouldn't sit in the waiting room, by the way, but if they did sit in the waiting room, they'd often be very suspicious, suspicious about the client. And if they were sitting there and say the therapist's door that they're going to see is next to that waiting room, client comes out, the paranoid client would be very suspicious and jealous without any justification of what's you know uh, of the relationship with the previous client because in their background um they've been let down they've been hurt um life's been unpredictable uh, they haven't been able to control events yeah so it's a it's a it's a it's a very unpredictable perilous um history they've usually had yeah Inconsistent parenting is one of the things I think that a lot of people talk about in sessions with me when, mm. yeah, it, it's that never knowing 100% mm. that mum or dad is going to be there emotionally available to them or turn up to pick them up from school or, you know, for whatever reason. Mm. That's right. That's correct. And so... The coping mechanism is to take control, to not uh, believe anything anyone says, to not trust people, to be suspicious, to be jealous, all in order to, to make the world predictable and to attack people before they attack them. Mm. 
So they will attack without justification before their thoughts are, anyway, is they get attacked by the other. They will blame others before they get blamed themselves. Yeah. Which is quite difficult for the, the, the paranoid client to, to be intimate with somebody else, to be vulnerable, to, you know, to, to be in relationships 100%. If they've got that lack of trust and feeling like they're always going to be let down and suspicious and all those sorts of things, it, it's, it's a challenge for a lot of clients. Oh, and they, yes, right. So um, it's hard to have relationships with people who are highly paranoid. Yeah. For, from that framework. And the other thing is, of course, they're hyper vigilance all the time. So their cortisols are very high levels and they're very, um, they're just always on guard. Mm. So it's hard to have a relationship with somebody who's actively paranoid. Or paranoid. Yeah. Because there's no trusting, there's no... And for them, it's also exhausting to be hypervigilant all the time. Like you say, you're kind of on that upper echelons of anxiety and stress all the time because you need to be on high alert. That's right. So in the transaction analysis world, which we both are, um, there's, a, there's a diagram in the TA world called the OK Corral. And Eric Byrne, and he took his ideas from Freud and actually, but you can also link it to a, attachment models. Um, and he, in the OK Corral, he talked about four existential positions that people come from throughout their life. And the paranoid person will come from uh, a place of I'm OK and you're not OK. Yeah. So from the beginning, the therapist isn't OK in the paranoid's eyes, which reflects his history from a coping place, of course. Yeah. So how do you prove that as a, as a therapist? Like we said, being consistent, showing up. Do you think you ever gain 100% trust from somebody that has paranoid traits? Well, I was, well, let's say traits rather than personality disorders yeah. or, or tends to be up the continuum because I'm not sure if you do right up there. Yeah. Um, but if we're talking about trains, I think we can get to a place where we can offer them a different type of world if they want to step into it. Now, the question is how you do it. Firstly, patience. Mm. You have to be very, very patient. You have to, uh, you have to create a world what you were talking about early on, I think. In terms of consistent boundaries, structure, reliability, all the things you were just talking about. So they have a different type of experience. They're not going to easily buy into that because they will, in their child, think it's a trick. Yeah. Now, where you're heading towards the par paranoid client, of course, is the scared, frightened child underneath all the layers of defense. Now, their layers of defense is to attack, to blame, and to take control before you do. Yeah. In, their, in their their thinking so it's not straightforward work methodologically but if you hold in your head that you are attempting to reach that vulnerable scared frightened child i think you've got more of a chance um the problem is if the therapist takes it all personally yeah yeah if they take the attack the blame the lack of trusting the um the suspicion or personally then things will go very wrong mm. yeah and i can see how that works because if you're in a, in a situation where you're feeling like you're not trusted and you know that you are a very trustworthy person you're going to kind of buy into that constantly trying to prove that you are trustworthy and yeah oh. yeah and uh, it's the same if you it's the same for all these things, all these processes, in a way. Harder for, I think, if people are borderline, if you are looking at borderlines or paranoid clients or, or, or antisocial clients or, or people that attack um, uh, and uh, not, not just attack, but attack without any justification 
Um, if the therapist takes any of these processes personally, they're, they're, they're lost. Yeah. Um, they can go, the best thing is they go to their own therapy and go to their own supervisor to talk about all their uh, issues they have with these types of clients. What this type of client needs is an environment you talked about earlier on and a client who will stay with them and inquire underneath the attacks. Yeah. And, and inquire uh, gently about what's what's underneath um, the, the, the process of over control, process of suspicion, the process of jealousy, and if it actually helps them in their life. Yeah. Yeah, I think as a, as a, a parent and ex foster carer, the way that I relate that is, you know. <laughs> there's always something behind the behavior often we focus on the behavior and take that personally whereas it's a form of communication with a lot of children you know I, I work a lot with kids and it's kind of looking behind the behavior mm. Mm. it's easier to not take it personally if we do that and like you were saying looking at the scared child the child that's trying to protect itself if we can keep that in our mind's eye mm then the distrust and the behavior that's in front of us it's easier to take it less personal absolutely i think it's another philosophical absolutely jackie absolutely and there's another philosophical principle to bear in mind here that however bizarre the behavior or the paranoia in this case that if you trace back to the childhood it will make perfect sense in that context yeah. It doesn't make sense in the context of the psychotherapy room necessarily yeah. in the present day, but if you traced it back, this behavior, these thought processes to the early childhood where the, the client comes from, that bizarre behavior will make utter sense. Yeah, 100% sense, yeah. <laughs> so it's how you get back there. Yeah. Number one, you don't take it personally. Uh, number two, that you can see the scared child, hopefully. Uh, and number three, I think a lot of search for, uh, you know, in, or inquiry, if you like, about the coping mechanisms which were set up all those years ago to protect them from what? Now, as, it, as we know, it's probably to protect, it will be protect, to protect them for, from trauma, from unpredictable life, from abuse, from a place where they've been let down or they've been not understood or they've been misattuned or they've not been met. It'll be all those things where the, the child has felt so scared that the only way they can protect themselves or the only way they can see themselves protect themselves is to attempt to blame, to attack, to take control, to be suspicious, to be jealous, et cetera, et cetera. And then that way, they create a whole barrier or series of barriers around themselves. And hopefully from their perspective, will never be hurt. Problem is, what you said earlier on, how do they then reach out to the world in an authentic way where they can ever be in a relationship which is healing or trusting? Mm. Yeah, and like you said earlier on, patience. It's, it's, it takes a lot of patience. Yeah. It takes a lot of patience from the therapist, but if you can reach beneath those coping mechanisms to the different levels of scare within beneath the paranoia and inquire what was happening in their world at that time, you have much more chance of um, helping them heal that scare. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I'm, I'm not sure how you feel about this, but with clients that show personality traits such as paranoia i do my utmost to not get in a tug of war with them <laughs> of, of trying to prove certain things i kind of let go of the rope at some points and you know if if there's a lot of resistance to what i'm saying i won't push it i will just let them stay in that place for a while without encouraging them out of their comfort zone let's put it that way yeah because like, they're already putting up another barrier they're already distrusting yeah, whatever yeah. it is 
that, well, I mean, what you're saying is really important. You can leave your own ego outside the room because their their major major actual defense mechanism is to control yeah and to attack yeah so if you move into any thing which can be perceived as, as a controlling battle the only person to lose will be you yeah because they're used to that yeah that's, their, that's the way they survived and that's what they expect the world to be like and if you move into that then there's only one way or only one process you know you'll end up in a battle and it goes nowhere in fact what will happen will be a repeat of history yeah yeah to the client yeah uh, prove a point i told you so <laughs> well, that's the major game yeah yeah you know, the major game i told you so and in transactionality terms now i've got you son of a bitch yeah very common game in ta but a very common game for power noise yeah and at some point we need to do the game playing because i find that fascinating yeah so so the other side of things i think you know touching on it just before we wrap up the the paranoid personality trait is that th there's there's a lot of strategy and a lot of thinking they're very much in the heads there's not a lot of feeling and emotion no. stuff goes no. on with this it's it's very logical it's very cognitive it's all well yes that's as you go down the layers you do need to get to feel this actually yeah. um uh, of course but a good way to get to feeling is to ask them what they think about what they're feeling yeah <laughs> you know yeah. Like, it sometimes stops them dead in the tracks what yeah, yeah go through <laughs> that frame of reference yeah and i think with all the styles we're talking about you need to go with their frame of reference whatever that is yeah. Whether it's, whether, it's a, whether it's about withdrawing, so maybe you need to think about initiation, whether it's about in the world of cognition, then for what you've just said there, meeting with a thinking level. Uh, what, if you talk about histor histrionics, meeting them at the feeling level, we have to meet them where they come in. Yeah. And then we need to go beneath that whole world. And with the paranoia to gently ask them what they think about what they're feeling or finding a way to go down beneath the cognition is vitally important to reach the what I believe is beneath it all which is a huge scare of the world yeah. these are people who are very 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 scared and afraid of living because they always believe they're going to be attacked they're going to be hurt yeah. they're going to be swallowed up they will cross the road, you know, without any justification that the other person on the road is going to hurt them. But because they see the person frown or so they see the person, I don't know, go, put their hands in their pockets, they think they think the person is going to attack them or hurt them. They're, they may continue down the road, but they often, they're often might cross the road because they fear conflict. Now, of course, if it's a personality disorder, another story, but they live in a perpetual world of fear. Yeah. So again, you know, if, if you're aware of that and see that scare, then being compassionate towards the behavior and understanding in that, that's that's the way to do it, is to see it is all coming from a place of fear and scare. Yeah. That's right. And you know, the therapist. I agree with you again, and also to be aware that they may see any attempts of compassion or in TA language nurturing strokes as a trick. Mm. Yeah. So really not it's really important not to go and overwhelm them with loads and loads of positive strokes or positive nurturing or positive compassion or whatever you want. So it might be much more compassionate to find a way to think about the timing of yeah. positive strokes and compassion rather than just give them a full meal because these people are people who have grown up without a full meal. Yeah, yeah. And it, it can be seen as quite condescending. Mm. Mm. It, you know, the, if, they, if they're trying to control their environment and suddenly you're being quite, you know, Mm. over the top in validating and affirming everything that they're doing they might see that as, as quite condescending mm. 
again, because they're in that cognitive place, the feelings, the emotions don't mean anything. Well, they mean that you might be able to trip them. Yeah. So, so um, you're right. I think it's a good point to make. But you are, in the end, uh, need to get to their feelings and need the cognition. Yeah. So, to to summarise, it's kind of like being in a minefield sometimes, being in a therapy room with somebody <laughs> that has paranoid personality traits. Yeah, and they want to be in. <laughs> they want to be in control. Of yeah. That minefield. Yeah. They have the map. They know where all the mines are. And where the traps are and where the tricks are. But it's yeah. usually without any justification. So if you can get underneath that, uh, you know, that whole, those whole coping mechanisms to get to the, the scared child who imagines where these maps and traps are and everything else that goes with it. Yeah, compassion is a very good way to get there. But you need to, I think, with timing is everything in psychotherapy. Yeah. But we're not rushing it, are we, Bob? We're not doing yeah, it in any This age. type of client, no, slow, patient work. Yeah. So with that, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. And the next one, we're going to be looking at passive aggressive. Yes. So another traits of yours, is it? No, that's the one. That one's not one of mine. <laughs> is that one of yours, Bob? Uh, well, no, it's, no, if you talk about traits, it's really interesting. If we were going to passive aggressive, let's switch to passive aggressive then. Okay. Wait a minute. Let's finish this one and we'll do that in the next episode. Oh, you want me to finish this one? Finish what? this one first. Draw this one to an end. Oh, let's let's draw this in. I want to I like to say something positive about the power, power people who have paranoid traits. So you know, the nickname that was given by uh, Paul Ware and Van George in a book called Personality Adaptations, I think it was 2002, they called the paranoid client brilliant skeptic and they have wonderfully brilliant minds they think very well they're very very good thinkers and they're very engaging people from that frame of reference and i think if you can meet them at that level uh, uh, of that that level of thinking you're going to go a long way yeah and in a lot of work environments they're really good because they're very detailed focused <laughs> Very specific and detailed, and ask yes. lots, of, lots of questions. Which in certain jobs is a must. Certainly is. Go a long way with lots of asking. The devil's in the detail, eh? That's the one. That's the one. Right. See you in the next episode, Bob, where we'll be talking about yeah. passive aggressive. Passive aggressive, aggressive yeah. 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 See you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Passive. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.